Hello and welcome to another Common Core Algebra 1 lesson. I'm Kirk Weiler, and today we're going to be doing Unit Number 5, Lesson Number 2, Solving Systems by Substitution. Before we begin, let me remind you that you can find the worksheet and a homework assignment that go with this video by clicking on its description, or by visiting our website at www.emathinstruction.com. As well, don't forget about the QR codes on the upper right-hand portion of any worksheet. These will allow you to use your smartphone or a tablet to scan the code and come right to this video. All right, let's begin. In the last lesson, we saw how to solve a system of equations by graphing both equations and finding their intersection points. Because at those intersection points, of course, both equations were going to be true and thus satisfy the definition of a system which is that both equations are true at the same time. Today, we're going to be looking at solving systems by doing something called substitution. And the first exercise walks us through that process and why it works. So let's take a look. In the first problem, we have this system, 2x plus y equals 9 and y equals x minus 3. Letter A asks us to show that 4 comma 1 is a solution to the system. So you've seen this many times. I'd like you to pause the video and work through part A. All right, let's do it. So what we have to do to always show that something is a solution to a system is show that the point makes both equations true. So we're going to take that 4, put it in for x, put 1 in for y. We'll get 2 times 4 is 8. 8 plus 1 is 9. 9 is equal to 9. Check. Then we've got y equals x minus 3. This is going to be even easier. We'll put 1 in for y. We'll put 4 in for x. 4 minus 3 is 1. So yeah, right? True, true gives me yes. All right. Now, letter B says substitute x minus 3. x minus 3 is an expression, right? That's just an expression. Substitute x minus 3 in for y in the first equation and show that the point 4 comma 1 is still a solution to this new equation. In other words, I'm going to take this and I'm going to substitute it into this equation. So, and actually let me put it in parentheses. Right Now what I want to do is show that this thing is still a solution to this new equation. Now that may seem weird, um, primarily because y isn't here anymore. Right, But hey, whatever, that just means I don't put the 1 in anywhere. Anyway, 2 times 4 is 8, 4 minus 3 is 1, and 9 is equal to 9. So yeah, it is. Now, what... Why is that a good thing? Well, it's a good thing because it means anytime we ever substitute one equation into another, it still means that those two equations have the same solutions. Okay? This is what's known as the principle of substitution. Equals can be substituted for equals. And of course, the big advantage of substitution is as soon as I put that x minus 3 in for y, there is no y left, right? There's no y no y left. And that allows me to solve for x, right? I can use the associative property of real numbers to decide to add these two, right? That'll give me 3x minus 3 is equal to 9. Using the addition property of equality, I can add 3 to both sides, giving me 3x is equal to 12. And dividing both sides by 3, oh, I'm getting low down here, I get x equals 4. Now, that, that's not the final answer. The final answer is 4 comma something. And of course, we know the comma is 1. To figure out the y-coordinate, we can take 4 and we can substitute it then into either this equation or this equation, whichever is easiest. I think this is the easier equation, y equals x minus 3. Because all I have to do is put the 4 in and I'll find that y is equal to 1. And that means the point 4 comma 1 solves this system. It's really quite nice, right? And it works on a very simple principle, the principle of substitution of equals. Equals can be substituted for equals. Very important. In fact, let me clear out this text, so pause the video if you need to. 
All right, here they go. Ready? Wait for it. Oh. Equals may be substituted for equals. So important I had to light it on fire. And somehow then it appeared. I don't know. Anyway, as far as special effects go, it's kind of snappy. The, the point is, anytime two things are equal to each other, they can replace one another. And we're going to use that to our advantage when we solve systems using substitution. So anyway, let's get some practice on this. Exercise two, solve the following systems of equations by substitution. All right, this is cool. So letter A, it's very, very easy. Um, notice the equality here. That means that 2x plus 5 can be substituted for y. So I'm going to take the expression 2x plus 5, and I'm going to substitute it down into this equation for that y. Sometimes, many times, in fact, teachers will call this setting equations equal. Now, I like that phrase, and I use it a lot myself, but never, never look past the fact that what you're doing still is substitution. Now, once you have that, what's really great is you can just solve this equation the way you always do. I'll use the addition property of equality to add 3x to both sides. 2x plus 3x is 5x. All right, likewise, I'll use the addition property to add a negative 5 to both sides. Negative 10 and negative 5 is negative 15. And then, of course, I'll use the multiplication property of equality to divide both sides by 5, giving me x equals negative 3. I still need to get my y value, though. I can pick either two of these equations. It doesn't matter which one, but I'll go with the first one because it's just as easy as the second. And I'm going to put in negative 3 for x, right? Now I just have to evaluate. 2 times negative 3 is negative 6. Negative 6 plus 5 is negative 1. So y equals negative 1. It's completely okay to leave your solution that way, or you could write it as a coordinate pair. Just be careful to make sure to get the order right. Negative 3, negative 1. Now, letter B is actually a bit more challenging, because the first equation isn't rearranged into y equals form. But that's okay. The second one is. Right? So we can take this, and we can substitute it in for that y. Now, I should be very careful, though, all right? That y is being multiplied by negative 2. So I have to remember to put parentheses around the negative 5x plus 13, or I won't remember to multiply it all by negative 2. And in fact, the first thing I want to do is use the distributive property and distribute that multiplication by negative 2. So negative 2 times negative 5x is positive 10x. And then negative 2 times positive 13 is negative 26. I can now use the associative property, which tells me I can add in any order I want. So, simple enough. The additive property of equality allows me to do something like that. 14x is equal to, what would that be, 42. And now I can divide both sides by 14. And although it may not be obvious, x is equal to 3. Now I've got to figure out which one to substitute it into. In this case, I think it is much, much easier to substitute it into this. So I'll get y is equal to negative 5 times 3 plus 13. So y is negative 15 plus 13 which is negative 2. So again, a nice way of writing this would be 3 comma negative 2. That's it. Equals can be substituted for equals. And that's a simple enough scenario. All right. So I'm going to clear out the screen, write down what you need to. All right, here we go. Let's keep going. This is a fun kind of problem next. Max and his father, Kirk, are comparing their ages. They know that the sum of their ages is 52, and Kirk is seven years older than four times Max's age. If Max's age is represented by M, and Kirk's age is represented by K, 
Write a system of equations that describes the two relationships from the problem. All right, the two relationships. Well, here's one of the relationships. The sum of their ages is 52. That's going to be easy, right? Max's age plus Kirk's age must be 52. No problem. But here's the other relationship. Kirk is seven years older than four times Max's age. So Kirk is seven years older than four times Max's age. Well, four times Max's age looks like this, and then seven years older looks like that. So this is a good way to model this problem using equations, right? We're modeling the problem using equations. Now we can solve the system to find both their ages, right, by doing substitution. We can in fact take the 4m plus 7 and substitute it in right there. So m plus 4m plus 7 equals 52. Do a little associative property and add those m terms together. Additive property of equality gets rid of the 7 on that side. And multiplicative property allows us to get Max's age. And he's 9. 9 going on 14. All right, so Max's age is 9, right? And Kirk's age is 4 times 9 plus 7, right? Because I can just take this and plug it in here. Can't believe I just drew that arrow that well. So Kirk is 43. All right, Max is 9, Kirk's 43. Right, we're able to solve this almost like riddle-like problem by doing it this way. It's kind of cool, isn't it? All right, I'm going to clear out this text. Here we go. Keep going, keep going. All right, two cell phone plans offer different text packages. I think you've probably seen something like this before, not just this problem, but just text packages. The two plans are outlined below. Plan A charges $5 per month, along with a charge of $0.03 cents, right, per text. Plan B, there is no monthly charge, but the texts are a lot more expensive, $0.10 cents per text. Is there a certain number of texts when the two plans cost the same amount? Determine your answer by setting up a system of equations that model the two plans. So, really, at the end of the day, this is a yes-no question, right? You know, is there a certain amount of text, 20 texts, 52 texts, whatever, where the two plans will be the same? So, let's do it. Let's set up equations, shall we? Let's model it. Um, why don't we say C for cost? All right, well, plan A is going to cost $5.00 right up front, plus 0 0.03 times the number of texts that we, that we make, right? So if I take 3 cents and I multiply it by the number of texts and add 5, that's, that's plan A. Plan B, on the other hand, the cost will simply be 0 0.10 times the number of texts. Okay, so to figure out where the two things are the same, I will literally solve this system. I will take this, I'll plug it in here, or the other way around, 5 plus 0.03t equals 0.10t. Use the additive property of equality and subtract a 0.03t from both sides. We'll get 5 is 0.07t. No problem there, I don't think, right? Divide both sides by 0.07. And the number of texts, because I don't really want to do this in my head, is 71.428. All right, so what's the answer? I'd like you to pause the video and think about what the answer is. All right, let's do it. The answer is no. That's the answer, right? Is there a certain number of texts when the two plans cost the same? And the answer is no. Why? Because 
there are no fractional texts, right? In other words, this answer is in a certain sense non-viable. Non-viable. A viable answer is one that works, one that is realistic, one that we can use. But that's a non-viable answer, right? What it's saying is that at 71.428 texts, these two plans are going to cost the same. But that doesn't make any sense. You, you don't make 71.428 texts. What, what would that mean? You'd made 71 texts and then you'd gotten part of the way through one before you bailed out on it? You know, there are some people I definitely change my mind whether I'm going to text them in the middle of the text, but it doesn't, I don't get charged for a portion of a text, right? So that quite frankly, the answer here is no. But the algebra allows us to figure that out. All right, I'm going to clear this out and then we're going to do one more problem. Here we go. All right, it's gone. Okay. A man and a woman start 380 feet away from each other and walk in a straight line towards each other. If she is walking at a rate of six feet per second and he's walking at a rate of two feet per second, when will they meet? All right. Well, there are lots and lots of different ways of doing this problem, okay? I'd like you to pause the video and see if you can come up with one method. I don't want you to worry about whether you do it using something that like is a system of equations. That's the way I'm going to do it eventually, right? But I just want you to figure out when they're going to meet, okay? All right, let's do it. So I don't know how you did it, but if you end up getting the same answer I got, then I'm sure you did it in a good way. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually set up a number line. I'm going to say that she's at zero and he is at 380. All right. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep track of their position. I'll call it P. Right. So the woman starts at zero. Right. That's her Y intercept, so to speak. And she's walking at six feet per second. I'll use T to stand for time. So that's really her position. The man, on the other hand, his position, he starts at 380, but since his position is decreasing, right, he's getting closer to zero, I then subtract 2t. All right, those are their two positions. When they meet, the two positions must be equal. So I'm going to use substitution, and I'm going to substitute this into here. I'll get 380 minus 2t is equal to 6t, right? I can use the additive property of equality and add a 2t to both sides. 380 equals 8t. Using the multiplicative property of equality, I can divide both sides by 8. And I'll find that they meet after 47.5 seconds. So if you got 47.5, whether you did it this way or not, you did a nice job, okay? Believe it or not, we actually did a problem almost identical to this on the first lesson that we taught in this curriculum. I think that we had a man and a daughter walking towards each other. I think they were 300 feet away, and we did it in a way that was a little bit different than this, all right? So let me clear this screen out and get rid of whistling man. Here we go. All right, let's finish up. Bye-bye, whistling man. Okay, so today we saw yet another way of solving a system of equations, right? The first way we saw was by graphing the two equations and finding out where they intersect. The second way is now by substitution. This is also another method that you were expected to learn in Common Core eighth grade math, but if you, if you forgot how to do it or if you never learned how to do it, hopefully this lesson got you there. All right. For now, let me thank you for joining me for another Common Core Algebra 1 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until next time, keep thinking and keep solving problems.